Okay, I think we'll kick off. I think that's about about it. So, um, hello and welcome to today's webinar. Um, this session is part of the IWA and Canal and River Trust Training and wor Workshop Programme 2023-24. Um, my name's Emma Hunt um, and I work as project manager for the Canal and River Trust. Um, we also have Verena um, from the IWA joining us today. Do you want to just give us a wave, Verena? <laughs> yes. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this webinar. My name is Verena Leonardini and I'm uh, Events and Restoration Hub Coordinator for the IWA. Okay, um, for today's webinar, we're joined by Terry Cavendish from Buckingham Canal Trust, Peter Birch and Mark Weatherall from the Canal and River Trust. Um, they're our guest speakers for today. Um, we're delighted to be covering the topic of dredging um, in today's session. Um, I'll hand you over to Verena now, who will just go through a bit of housekeeping before we hand over to the speakers. Right, thank you, Emma. So all attendees will have their microphones muted and the cameras switched off. If you have any questions for our speakers, please add them to the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And obviously we will address as many questions as possible at the end of the session. Um, some of you have found the chat box. Um, you can use it to introduce yourself and the society you are coming from and uh, to share any comments or experiences. But please remember to change the chat options to all panelists and attendees so that your comments can appear for us all. It's important to use the Q&A feature for any questions as questions submitted in the chat box might get lost. Uh, we will be recording this webinar and the link will be shared uh, with you in due course uh, so you can refer back to it at any time. So I will hand over to Peter to start this session. Hi everybody and welcome. I'm Peter Birch. I'm the Dredging Asset Manager for the Canal and River Trust. Um, so the structure today is going to be, I'm going to give you a few slides on um, the, the kind of the general dredging issues and some notes on how they might differ for restoration dredging as compared to the maintenance dredging of an existing navigation. Then my colleague Mark Weatherall, who's one of our experienced project managers, will talk you through some of the recent restoration dredging that's being done on the Montgomery Canal. And as Verena said, Terry Cavender has, has got uh, a presentation then on the work of the Buckingham Canal Society. Um, with some of the particular ins and outs on restoration dredging that they've been involved with. Um, as Rena said, you could hold questions till the end, and then that will enable us to get through the presentations, and then we can pick up as many questions as possible after that. So, if I bring up my slides. Hopefully everybody should be able to see that, uh, and we'll kick off. Um, so, as I said, I'm going to talk briefly about how restoration dredging might differ from normal maintenance dredging on these key kinds of issues, planning, ecology, contamination, the quantity of material, the methods of working and disposal, um, and then we'll get on to some case studies. Um, so, the first thing then, in terms of planning and other regulations, so this fairly routine site of, uh, of narrow dredging on one of our canals um, is understood by most regulators and planners as being maintenance work. This is the sort of thing that wouldn't need planning permission and although may still need other consents such as triple SI consents or, or other things and certainly these waste disposal elements, because it's seen as maintenance dredging, those regulatory regimes are much better understood and, and straightforward. Uh, but this, which is the Rochdale restoration from 20 odd years ago, um, is a lot harder for the regulators to see as maintenance or dredging, or indeed even as dredging. Um, and Terry will talk in his example later about uh, when when is working a canal dredging and when might it not be seen as such. Um, but the planners would look at this type of work on the Rochdale and go, this isn't maintenance, this is construction work and possibly even a change of use. Um, and then they start getting interested in having planning permission um, and that also means that other regulators might take a different view on it as well. And once you have to apply for planning permission for works, then the planners will be interested in all the other issues I'm going to talk about as well, in addition to, to any other regulations that apply. So, so working, if you like, out of the water and restoring 
a, a water body rather than just maintaining something that's already there and in use uh, can lead you to have to deal with an awful lot more regulations than than we as navigation authority have to when we're when we're maintaining the water body. Um, so the first one of those will be ecology. Ecology and wildlife are always a big issue, even on maintenance dredging, even on a busy waterway like here on the, the, the photo of the River Saw. Um, there'd still be a lot of issues related to wildlife impacts of dredging because it's potentially a very disruptive um, activity. But those impacts are generally short term and they're generally well understood um, to be actually part of maintaining the wetland habitat, the waterway habitat that's there. Um, and so what wildlife impacts of dredging on a navigable canal are very different from if you're dredging in a canal that's not navigable, even one that's still in water here. This is the Manchester Boltman Berry. Um, yeah, the, there's a very clear difference in ecological terms between taking some mud out of the bottom of something that, that is a water body and then digging through what is effectively a totally different habitat to create a water body. Um, and the result of that, is that a while that might still not be impossible, it's likely to require much more mitigation and compensation to uh, to try and offset some of the inevitable impacts of, of the work. So, for instance, at the Droitwich, um, the restoration was required to leave in far more of the reed fringe than perhaps the original design might have called for, um, giving us a narrower navigational channel than the original width of the canal because the reed better become so established during the period when the canal wasn't in use. Um, and we also on the Droitwich had to do quite substantial offsite compensation for the loss of habitat within the canal channel. Um, so this is Coney Meadow, which is about four and a half hectare site, which the restoration had to purchase at the bottom end of the canal and then manage and maintain to create this rebed habitat as partial compensation for what was being lost on the canal with the restoration of navigation. And that's a fairly common feature for for canal restorations where an existing valuable and interesting habitat has come into the waterway while it's not being navigable. The other issue that's often very different for restoration than maintenance dredging is about the contamination, the nature of the material. Uh, so normal routine maintenance dredging, um, you're only really dealing with, with current contamination, so it will be the current uses and generally because of the environmental legislation that, that we've introduced in, in the UK over the last 50 years. Our canals and waterways are much, much cleaner than they were 100 years ago. And there's far less pollution going into them. And so for our routine dredgings, we don't have massive issues with contamination across the, across the network. There are still some places, of course. But for restoration, the issue is you're dealing with historical contaminants that went into the canal, the, the source of which might not be visible anymore. So this little flaming bit of mud um, is from works I was involved with on the Rochdale Canal restoration, where we started dredging one particular section within Manchester. And as soon as the material came out into contact with the air, it started spontaneously combust combusting um, and in fact exploding as well when the digger was actually digging through it. Um, and, it and eventually it came to light that this was because there was a chemical works adjoining the site that unbeknownst to us, had had drains and discharges into the canal and so the canal was full of various toxic various interesting exotic chemicals that had come from those chemical works now that's not something that you would have to deal with in terms of routine dredging because the discharges have been cleaned up for 50 years you wouldn't face that kind of historical contamination but in a restoration you have to be a bit more concerned about not actually knowing what's, what's in there, what's being used as the infill, what's being discharged into it historically and still lies there undisturbed. Obviously, if you're in a rural canal, this would be much less of a problem. But for urban canals, there's a very high probability that um, infill that was put in during the 60s or 70s or discharges that the canal were, was receiving prior to that could cause this type of, uh, of more exotic problem. Um, the other issue to always think about is the quantity of material. Um, the amount of material that you're shifting can make a very can have a very big impact, obviously, in the costs um, for dredging, either because of the time or because of the disposal arrangement. This is a fairly typical canal cross section for maintenance dredging. The green line is is the current bed. The red box is our kind of critical trigger um, that once the canal once the canal bed starts to to present within that red box, we start thinking about needing to dredge. 
And the purple line is a typical kind of dredging profile, which you can see might take about 300 mil or a foot off within the central channel and then a bit of the sides on the batters as well. And that might generate something of the order of two cubic meters per linear meter of canal to dredge. So a couple of thousand cube per kilometre. Uh, but if you're dealing with a restoration and even something like the Manchester Bolton and Berry photo that I showed earlier, where you've got some water and there's maybe a foot of water across the whole canal that those reeds were growing in. Uh, but even so, you can you can see there that compared to that line to the purple line that shows the, the profile that we want to achieve, the volume difference is enormous. Um, and it wouldn't be surprising if you have to shift four times as much material when you're restoring a, a canal that's in water like that rather than, than the, the, the two metres cube that we'd have to do for maintenance dredging. For dry canals, it might not be so bad because there might actually be less deposition um, taking place in a in a dry, dry canal bed rather than in a in a, a bed that's still in water but not being navigated. Um, but also some canals like the Rochdale were infilled. So that red line was actually about where we wanted the water line to be. So there's substantial amounts of material to, to come out. Um, and those those large quantities then make the method of disposal and, and, and the method of dredging more difficult because of the volumes that you're having to handle. Um, so, for instance, in terms of methods of working, so our normal method, of course, in water, we'd have a piece of floating kit, we'd have some hoppers, um, all that equipment needs to be craned in at some point near the work site, but then is able to move backwards and forwards along the canal. It gives you a wide range of opportunities for access and unloading points and therefore disposal options because it's anywhere that you can reach um, along the banks of the canal and um, could be brought into use. Um, but for a canal that was under restoration where maybe you haven't got that water, then you're almost certainly going to have to use land-based plants in, instead. That might make access into the canal to do the works more difficult. Um, of course, it might make things easier that you're able to use just routine, normal excavating kit and, and dumper trucks and so on to, to move things backwards and forwards. Um, so there are some pros and cons of, of how big an issue um, that might be in terms of your method of working and, and how you go about it. Uh, and of course, here on the Rochdale, because it was a hard infill, we were actually, it was quite easy to run um, either the wagons immediately to the work site to be loaded direct or to run dumper trucks along the site to a, to a suitable point to carry out that offloading. So, so for the Rochdale, given that it was such an urban setting, the fact that there was hard infill and that we were able to take the water out very easily actually made removal easier. Um, if we'd had to do this with floating plants and in the wet, then the fact that it was an urban area and access points were, were very difficult to come by would actually have made it harder for us to, uh, to cope. Um, and finally, thinking about disposal, um, obviously in a nice rural setting, if you haven't got too much material to get rid of, Dredging to banks in this way um, is the easiest and best way to get rid of the material. Uh, we also take a lot of material for agricultural disposal, um, and some of the contractors have started with with at the at the request of the farmers have started actually using this method of spreading, um, so they can spread the material over a very large area but put only a very thin layer uh, onto it. Uh, which particularly for pasture land, this is ideal because you don't want to be ploughing it in. This just to, to treat it effectively like muck spreading and enables you to cover a, a very thin area. Um, obviously, going back to my point about contamination, this is fine for very clean material, um, but not something that you could do with, with contaminated material. Um, the other issue is always going to be about size and scale. Um, this is an agricultural disposal site where the material is being screened and then bladed out. And we've got a drone shot um, from cruising the cut of, of this particular disposal site. So you can see the size of areas that you're going to start to need. If you're only able to put the material down in a kind of six inch lane, then you need a, a very substantial area to get rid of significant quantities. This works really well with wet material that's easy to blade. It's a bit harder for, for dry material. Um, so again, the, a combination of the quantities, the points of access, the contamination, all of which might be substantially different for restoration than the maintenance dredging, 
um, can make a big difference to, uh, to 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 what you have to do in terms of disposal. And quite often that means that material has to go to landfill that maybe from a maintenance viewpoint you wouldn't have done so, but if the quantities are too large or the contamination is such that um, the other disposal options aren't suitable, then this might end up being um, what you have to, to look at doing. Um, we've also encountered from in a restoration context far more issues with trying to reuse the material or to recycle it. Um, the waste, there are extensive waste reg regulations around reuse and, and recycling of materials. They do get quite complex once the word dredgings comes in because some of the exemptions only apply to dredgings, some of the exemptions only apply to soil. Um, and so some of Terry's points when we get to his talk about whether digging in the dry is actually dredging or not can become quite relevant to, to your disposal option. Um, and also trying to justify that the material is not waste because you've got a use for it can be very difficult as well. And it often ends up being easier to easier from the regulator's viewpoint and therefore in practice for yourself to look at just making use of that big list of, of exemptions and trying to find a, a way for the material to, to fit into an exempt category rather than having to take it away to landfill. It can be very expensive. So as I say, quick whistle stop run through there of just some of the the typical issues of dredging and, and how they can be a bit more different for restoration than than for the maintenance work that, that we routinely do on, on our navigations. Um, and now Mark has got some stuff on the current work that he's been doing on the Montgomery. So over to you, Mark. Thank you, Peter. Good afternoon. Uh, my name's Mark Weatherall. I'm a senior project manager. I work for the Trust and British Waterways since 1983. So I'm just approaching 40 years for my sins. Um, I've had a variety of different roles in this time. So I've worked out in the bank actually physically doing dredging on plants and equipment and project managing. So I've got a fair bit of experience from both sides of the camp. Um, next slide, Peter. The, the length of the Montgomery Canal, which we're restoring at the moment, is from Ardley at the very bottom through to Lanamanic Bridge, which is on the border of Wales and England. Uh, it's LUF funded and it incorporates bridges through the woods, lifting up some bridges or demolishing of culverts and installing bridges and compensatory. Reserves. So we're looking at two or three reserves as block compensation for the dredging. Obviously, the dredging and the lots of compensation. Don't know why we want to talk a little bit about that. Next right. slide, Peter. Um, these are the profiles which we're trying to achieve. Hi, Mark. Sorry to interrupt you. We have lost you um, probably one or two minutes ago. We can't hear you very well. Um, attendees are saying. Can you hear me now? No? Not really. really well. You're coming through very quietly. So we can just about hear you, but it's like you've gone down the end of a tunnel to talk to us. It was all right to begin with, so. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm not familiar with Zoom, so I don't know if I change the microphone level. Um, has anything improved so I can spot on a reconnect? No, that's still the same. No, sorry. It just kind of cut out in the middle when you started, because when you were talking earlier, it was OK, and then it just kind of cut out halfway through a sentence. So in the chat, it's going to reconnect. Yeah, OK. Thank you. Has that helped at all? Oh, that's much better. Go on. That's great. Ah, brilliant. Okay. 
Uh, where, where did you lose them? Where should I pick up from? Mm. Now you're muted, Peter. <laughs> Just go from this slide, mate. Right. Okay. Yes. So, um, profiles. These are the profiles we're going to try and achieve on this canal. You'll notice um, the reed fringes both sides of the canal. Uh, we are a little bit limited on the profile because it is a, it's a fairly narrow canal. And in order to achieve the 5.2, 5.5 metre channel and the batters, which obviously help retain and stop the material slumping from the sides, we have to leave in quite a small fringe. Where the canal widens out, we will leave a wider fringe, um, but a metre soon grows to one and a half and two metres in time, especially if the canal's not used. But you'll notice the bridge, bridge profile is full depth, full width, because obviously they do tend to clog up quite a bit and quite quickly. So that will hopefully keep them clear for many years. Um, that one basically shows uh, the winding hole, which is obviously going to be 21 plus metres in order to get a boat turned. But we do leave a fringe at the back and a batter on the canal as well, because it does tend to slow boats down as they push the nose in, rather than just keep eroding the bank and making a winding hole that's 40 metres wide into a farmer's field, which they get a bit titchy about. And the bottom one, I can't quite see over that one, Peter. What's the description for that one? That's that, a bridge that was a moorings. A mooring, yeah. The only difference there is we've traced the fringe out, which shouldn't have been there anyway. To uh, around 900, usually, that will get 90% of the boats into the bank and be able to board. Next slide, please. So, the challenges of working on a restoration project um, we get all the usual challenges as you get with a, a normal priority projects job. But we do tend to find that a lot of the remainder waterways, the unnavigable waterways, are triple SI and sometimes SAC designated. That does pose quite a few issues to, for us. Um, we have to do a lot more investigation. We do the usual bed surveys, sediment analysis, water quality and turbidity checks. We'll also do a flora survey wildlife survey which includes your bats, water balls and other creepy crawlers. Um, we did actually do an eDNA test on the tannate, which was an, it's a new method where we're looking to try and distinguish if there is crayfish in the feeder and if so what type are they. So we obviously have the native, the non-native and then what they call the plague which is brought in by the non-natives and kills off all our native crayfish. Surprisingly, we've got a hit on all three. So I guess if it's correct, the long-term uh, prospect is that the crayfish will disappear completely apart from the invasive American. Um, but again, that's gonna be a, a suck it and see over a amount of time and see what happens. We also need to do a lot of historic checks because in Wales, especially around the canal, there's lots of old Iron Age settlements and lots of other remnants from uh, lime kilns and uh, other varieties from one of the sites that we brought up in the aeroplane crash in World War II. So there's quite a lot of history and interesting things we've come across from digging into the canal. And last but not least, utility collections. That will distinguish what crosses the canal and where. Um, Perception of just on that wall of bridge to Lamb Manic is um, got quite a few services. There's culverts, there's overhead cables, and there's a uh, main water going through the canal just near the wall of bridge as well. So, all these things need to be included in our, uh, as we go for everybody. Yes. I'll reconnect again, see if that helps. And keep your camera off and see if that helps. Yeah, that would be interesting.
Peter, Peter while we're waiting, waiting for him and Mark to rejoin, somebody did ask what, what SAC stands for. stands for. All right, sorry, yeah. Um, so that's Special Area of Conservation. So SSSI is Site of Special Interest, which is the UK level designation for wildlife sites. And then Special Area of Conservation is the next level up um, from when we were in the EU. Um, but because we transferred all EU legislation into UK law, they're still protected under UK law as well. But the regulations are more stringent than they are for uh, sites of special scientific interest. So, so the Montgomery is designated for that because there's a particularly rare pondweed that, that lives in the canal that, that likes the fact that the canal is still in water in Wales and that has very low levels of disturbance. And, and there are many water bodies like that in the UK where there's a bit of disturbance and you've still got the open water being maintained. It hasn't seceded off into a reed fringe um, and therefore the pondweeds are able to survive there. So that's quite a difficult balance to meet on a restoration because what the plant likes is the fact that there's almost no bone movement. Um, and obviously the restoration needs us to be able to increase levels of bone movement. Um, and trying to maintain the canal without increased levels of boat movement is actually very difficult and very expensive for us as well. So, Mark, you're back. No, you're muted now. Sorry, I got back in. Brilliant. Okay, I'm going to speed up a little bit because I don't know if it's going to happen again. Everything's working at my end, apparently. Um, NRW, I think we're just going to touch on that, the fact that we have to go through a lot of, that's a previous slide, Peter, we have to go through a lot of uh, hoops, especially working with NRW, because it is S SAC and SSI. So we do need approval. We need permits and licences to work within the SSI. Um, we have the protected and rare species of plants, uh, neuronium and pot compressors being two of the main culprits. Um, they will require special handling, which you do need a license to handle them. So when we do come to translocate and store the, the plants, especially the ronia, uh, we have to be very careful how we store them and keep them fit and healthy, ready to put back in once we've finished dredging. And they do like certain conditions, which is why we try and vary the profile slightly in the margins to give them the best opportunity to, to thrive. Um, we also have to carry out a habitat risk assessment. That's for the whole scheme um, with mitigation, obviously because we're removing so much vegetation from the channel. Um, when we do dredge, we will take the material and put it on the bank, preferably, and leave it for 24 hours. And that gives all the, the smaller vertebrates and other creatures a chance to get back into the canal from the wet dredgings before they get put into a bond and dry down, ready to go off site. Next slide, Peter, please. Um, landowners, we, we struggle with landowners on this section of Monty. We don't own a lot of land. We have a lot of land there. Um, so we need to get access agreements and offloading points. Um, that's a bigger problem. Normally, uh, if we're doing a canal like uh, Trent Mersey or Shropping or something like that, we would probably do seven kilometres in one hit. Just get it, get it done and get out. Because NRW like us to leave refuse on the canal, they don't like us dredging more than a kilometre without leaving a kilometre gap before the next kilometre we dredge. That's just... Um, to allow anything in the canals to be able to escape and get to a safe area, um, keep some of the, the plants in situ, and it gives us an opportunity to translocate to them locations as well if need be. So you can see that it's a three year scheme and there's going to be at least three phases. So that's all um, a big issue when it comes to productivity. Sorry, bear with me. So that's not Mark having a fit. That's because, unfortunately, he's working from home on his own at the moment and he's got a delivery that he's had to deal with this today. So. 
Sorry. Is that your delivery, Mel? Yeah. Well One of them, yes. Sorry. Um, so, yes, the landowners, we, we are being held to ransom a little bit because they know we haven't got any other opportunities. So the problem is that they know they're going to save us money, so they want more money. So it's, there's a lot of negotiation going on. We have secured a couple of locations at a very good price, which is good for the funder, good for the trust. Um, but again, it's something we need to look out for and purchasing land for the future of the Montgomery. Uh, whether it's for disposal, whether it's for access, is on our radar and we're looking at opportunities wherever we can to, to purchase swathes of land. Uh, sediment analysis, the, uh, every canal is tested before we dredge it. We've got to know what we're extracting from the canal, whether it's hazardous or non-hazardous. As soon as it's been categorised into has or non-has, we'll then go further on the non-has and look at is it suitable for agricultural benefit, spreading to land? Can it be used uh, behind Nicholas Bank or Wattle Pans or any other bank restoration? Or is it no good and has to go to landfill and probably be repurposed? We do send some stuff to Orgia, which repurpose it and blend it with fly ash so that it is reused. Um, we have a waste hierarchy and listed there is one to five. So that's our preference in terms of uh, disposal with landfill being the last option. Next one, please, Peter. Timing of the works. Um, we don't tend to dredge canals during the warm weather or the summer months. Um, basically, we have birds nesting, which cause problems if we can't dredge around a nest or we have to leave the nest in situ. Uh, there's also the problem with low DO during the summer. So we do a lot of DO testing. Um, we categorise a standard suite, moderate and a high risk. And that will all depend on the type of silk we're dealing with as well. And the weather conditions. So on the Monty, we are looking at a standard because we, we haven't got a lot of contaminants in there and it's normally cold so it, we don't have a lot of low DO problems but still we do monitor the canal three times a day, it's all logged um, with the time, the date, the DO readings, stability. So we've got a good idea of what's happening. We also have the Environment of the Champion which is one of the contractors trained to monitor the canal and the wildlife. So any fish in distress, we stop dredging immediately and we have aerators on standby. So we can get some oxygen back into the canal very quickly. So normally our window of opportunity is between October to early March. Again, that's all dependent on the weather and who knows what the climate's gonna do at the moment. We're also working the wettest time of the year, so we get a lot of, especially in Wales, a lot of uh, tributaries which are pushing water through from the hillside. That can have the potential to flood. It can have the potential to pull contaminants down into the canal. And of course, you get the turbidity problem as well. So we can sometimes deal with that by putting in silk curtains. Um, we've, we've been using bubble curtains recently which is basically like a, a hose with lots of holes in it. You pump compressed air through it and it creates lots of bubbles in a line. So anything that comes towards that sinks or if it's trash floating on the surface, it gets held along that bubble curtain. Then we can go along and clean it off. So we're not going to be contaminating other parts of the waterway while we're dredging. Uh, drying the material obviously is a problem, especially if it's going up to landfill. Landfills cannot take wet sludge, so we have to dry it sufficiently. And the, um, the very technical test that we do is a stick test. And in the 21st century, we have come to putting a stick in the mud. If it falls over, it's too wet. So, <laughs> yeah, it's unbelievable, but that's, that's the way they test it. And usually we can get it dried down fairly quickly. The, the last amount of material took out from walls 
was fairly granular, so it did drain fairly quickly and we managed to get it decided within months. Mark, I know, I know we're waiting, waiting to the DM questions, questions but somebody's, somebody's asked, asked what, what DM stands for. for. So DO is dissolved oxygen. Sorry, so. Yes, dissolved oxygen. It, it, it monitors how much oxygen is in the water. So uh, obviously the fish need that to survive. Um, I don't know a lot more I can tell you about it, to be honest. I'm not a scientist. I just know that it's oxygen in water and things need that to live in water. So we do monitor it. Um, ecology, uh, we have to ensure that, or we'll try and ensure that all the habitats are left as undisturbed as possible. Um, we do have a lot of surveys that go ahead of the works. Um, we, we try and plan the works as sensitive and look at the, the mythology of how we can cause less disturbance. We also look at creating habitat, so if there's an opportunity to create some habitat along the way, we all jump at that opportunity. It could just be stacking brush on the offside to create habitat for you know, hedgehogs and other creatures. Um, we also have the, the TPO checks on the trees before we do any work. We also have bats in the base, so anything that may present a potential roost they'll be identified and that tree will be preserved and will work around it as sympathetically as possible. Um, we also carry out water law surveys, the crayfish surveys we really talked about. And on the wall section, we did have a swan's nest and we've nested on the towpath side for many years. So that's also something you need to bear in mind when we're working is, you know, we, we are working ahead of the swans building it but where would they normally build it and how we can work around it and not disturb them or deter them from nesting. So that's just a little quirk of this project. I've never had that before, but we managed to, to do that quite successfully. And obviously everything we do is sustainable as far as we can make it. Um, I don't want to stay on that. We'll come the next slide, Peter, please. These are some pictures. Um, this is the section looking from Walls Bridge. The canal runs from the bottom left up to the top right. That's going towards Lanamarek. That's a natural gap in the hedge with the farmers cropping the field behind it. And in case you can't distinguish, the cow is at the forefront, full of reed, weeds, lilies, and everything else you can think of. That doesn't actually look as bad as it did a month later. You couldn't actually see any water, although it's hard to distinguish the water now. So the next slide will show you a comparison. That's February 23, when we just started work. Obviously, the, the, the growth has died down. Doesn't look quite as bad as it was, but there's still a lot of material just below the water. So you can just see the jib of the um, excavator. And they're clearing out and making the bones and the bones ready to the picture is, that, is that April 22? Yeah. Yeah. Top right hand corner, so April 22. I think that's what we So that's a canal approach. Is the sound going to get marked? marked. <laughs> There might be a big connection to do, or maybe uh, if you want to take the camera off, that might help. Hopefully, maybe now. Yes, go on. Ah, brilliant. So that's the bond. Uh, we create a big bond in the farmers' field to accept the waste. Uh, that's when we just started putting some waste into there. The next slide, please, Peter. That's the bond with 2,000 tonnes of material in it. Very wet. And that's when we started to create small grips to take the water away to the side and allow the dredgings to start drying out. So after it's dried down sufficiently, we windmill it, which is basically making little pyramids out of it in the lines so the wind can get through and it dries it out quicker. Next one, please, Peter. And 
aerial shot that just shows the dredger clearing the offloading point. Um, the bond in the top left, you can see ready to accept material. And we've got the security fence around because we had to demarcate where the water main goes through under the canal. The last thing we want is to put um, a bucket through that. And that's a, a good opportunity to use the amphib, which you can see there dredging. They don't have to have spud legs, so we've got less of a problem with dropping a spud leg down through any services or culverts. Next one, please, Peter. Uh, these, these next couple of slides are the tank feeder, which feeds from the Tank River down into the Montgomery Canal at Caragosa. So this is a kilometre away from where we're dredging. But getting a feed down the feeder is very important to, to maintain the flow in the canal, uh, not only for the wildlife and the ecology, but allow us to work with floating equipment. So that's just a comparison of what it was like and then what it looked like when we finished. The next slide, please, Peter, is pretty much the same. Talent feeder, very overgrown, dredged, the material was placed on the bank there, a bit like farmers when they do the ditching. So that would be a D1 exemption along the side of the feeder. Next one, please, Peter. This is part of the biosecurity. When we finish dredging, everything is jet washed, brushed and cleaned before it goes off site. That's to make sure we don't cross contaminate canals because uh, we did a job on the uh, Canuck extension that had a lot of invasive species on there. So obviously it's important that everything's cleaned down so we're not transferring the invasives onto a canal, which at the moment doesn't have them. So that's uh, a process which we always go through before the plant's taken from site. I think that's it, is it, Peter, is there any more? Uh, that's just a final shot of looking for Walls Bridge. That was taken about two months ago. So you can see that everything's greening up nice and the, the margins are starting to come back. And that will have a road through it this time next year, or at least the abutment's ready for a road. Brilliant. Thank you, Mark. Uh, Terry, over to you. Hi, everybody. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, everybody knows I've got a big voice, so I'm optimistic. Um, first off, I'm going to start with a picture. If I can get the technology to share the right screen. Let's try that one there. Many of you will doubtless recognize uh, Adrian, aka Velcro, um, here in our ancient excavator, just when we started digging out Bridge One at Cosgrove. The, the question, and, and we'll come back to it at the end, is is this dredging or not bearing in mind this is a remainder waterway bear in mind it was quite damp bear in mind there's a bit of groundwater there that you can see and the discussion we had with the environment agency was is this dredging and can it be classed as the waste exemptions that the guys have already talked about come back to that one in a moment uh, let me go to share the other, if I can get it right, you share that one there, come on, you can do it, there we go. Hopefully everybody can see the title slide there, coming up, um, dreaded dredgings, this is me, um, for those who don't know me, that's who I am, uh, Terry Gavender, I'm a trustee of the Buckingham Canal Society, act as an executive officer. I also sit on the East Midlands Regional Advisory Board with CRT, which is like a board of school governors, for want of a better expression for those going, what the hell is a regional advisory board? Um, Borton Meadow. So back in the mid-late 90s, um, before I got involved, the, the team were down there scrub bashing, left-hand picture, um, scrub bashing for years, all along trying to stop Mother Nature stealing back the entire line of the old canal. We were deliberately told to keep it short to discourage exotic species coming back because they don't like short grass because the 
Well, you, Pede, uh, the people that eat them, you know what I mean, um, come along and can see them. So they tend to avoid short growth. Uh, section was lined, as you can see on the right, and planted with locally prevalent species. That means anything growing along the Ouse Valley, or again, the big words. And that was done deliberately to prove that we could reintroduce the biodiversity after a section had been lined. And as the guys have said, lots of discussions with the planning team and the environment agency about what could and couldn't be put into the canal after we'd restored that section. This section's 450 meters long. Uh, it was rewatered 2015, and it's now described as the best man-made nature reserve in North Buckinghamshire. I'm desperately trying to avoid it becoming a triple SI, and we hope it doesn't. Although it'd be nice in some ways if it did, but it's such a pain in the butt. Um, we do have Bucks, Berkshire, Oxfordshire Wildlife Trust, Wildlife Recorder living nearby, and he goes over there about every six weeks and spends the best part of a day down there. We've got 12 different types of butterfly, four of which are on the endangered list, and long lists of other biodiversity down there with dragonflies and fish and toads and snakes and frogs. It's brilliant. Um, but it proves that as an exemplar section for restoration, we can recreate that biodiversity and help the loss of biodiversity and climate change. Um, scrub bashing again. The questions I'd advise you to ask is what's there, what's not, keep it short and remove any young saplings before they become established trees. Because when they're trees, they're a pain in the ass particularly if you're dealing with clay liner and the tree stump comes out and takes half the clay liner with it, you've now got what's commonly known as a bloody great leak. Um, grazing is good if you can get local landowners to graze the channel and get various animals in there because they all like eating different things. It saves you with a lot of manual labour of scrub bashing um, and avoids bonfires. Obviously, bonfires are not very good these days for air quality. My excuse is these pictures were from, as the little text up the top there says, 2002. So forgive me for the bonfires. Um, layers. I'm sure everybody knows this because they've all dug a hole. But um, stating the obvious, when we did the dry dredging of Cosgrove, we agreed this would be our method of working. So all the top growth was put on one side, um, along with its roots and part of the compost layer. The silt was put on a different pile. And then once we'd known, we knew what was in the silt from the testing beforehand, but once we got the silt out, we would use the silt for bank reinvestment effectively on the towpath side that it eroded. And all of the green and root and compost growth was put on the off side to improve and extend the wetlands. And for some of you who've been down there, it's amazing the wildlife that's in the offside now and how that's again, the biodiversity has been encouraged and supported by that. When you get down to the clay, when you're going through a dry channel, you're gonna find one of two things. Either it's wet and squidgy, hopefully, or it's dry and gravel. And, and that's just how the clay dries out and dehydrates it's a bit like the difference between grandma's apple crumble and apple pie. The apple crumble is much more crumbly and flaky, um, and that's what dehydrated clay looks like. Apple pie is how the clay should behave and actually have a sort of firmness and bond to it. And subsoil. Um, I can talk all day about don't put bentonite on top of limestone subsoil because it goes through ionic exchange and plays get a thousand times leakier and loses its water. We could have a different discussion on liners one day. Um, infill, beware of use whilst it was disused. We've had coal tar, old cars, um, animal carcasses, all sorts of things that have been dumped in the canal since it was abandoned, in quotes, because that's not a real abandonment, because it wasn't an abandoned canal. Ours is a um, remainder canal, but we can come back to that definition if anyone wants to ask. Um, the section we have at Thornton, for example, was used as an aircraft practice bombing range during the Second World War with a little hut for them to line up. And they practiced dropping concrete, bomb, um, concrete replica bombs, dummy bombs, onto the lock. 
but there's a lot of these concrete replica dummy bombs lying around in the various adjacent land. And um, the, the boys back in those days used to have a bit of a laugh and occasionally they'd chuck a live bomb in there amongst the dummies just to give the crews a bit of excitement. Uh, so yes, there are sort of one in 50, one in 100 of these bombs actually turn out to be live. That's something we've been discussing in terms of contaminated ground, but contaminated in a very different way to what you might be thinking about in terms of paint or anything else. But as Peter was saying, things that go bang. Um, good ways to find out what's there, geophysics, flyovers. You've got lots of people with drones these days. They, they'll all quite happily do you a freebie just for a bit of advertising on YouTube or whatever it is. Um, get flyovers at different times of the year. Look for nitrate trails. The grass grows in different ways where the old canal went. And if it suddenly changes colour, that's probably a bad point to go digging because there's something there that's made the grass change colour along the line of the old canal. Um, core sampling is another way to do it. You basically can do it relatively cheap just by getting a large steel tube, sticking an auger in and then knocking the tube down for the next 300 mil or whatever it is you want the core sample to be doesn't have to be high tech you can see what's there yourself and if you can't determine it then go talk to your local companies who will often help you as a charity to diagnose what's in the core sample if you've gone and got it out for them you may need to come back with professional core sampling but there's usually ways to influence local businesses go to a business breakfast and find one the next piece i just want to talk about was the bridge is it still dredging um as per the slide with adrian um, the mound, the mud, the water, the relic, the documentation. Basically, we had a collapsed bridge um, surrounded by mud with pools of water, and underneath it is an archaeological relic, relic of that. We needed to get lots of documentation. We needed to cover method statements with excavation, heritage, archaeology, spoil analysis, silk, all of those aspects on it. And we came up with a laser point scan. So here you get the inevitable video, which Hopefully I can pause at the right point. Um, I'll just go back a microsecond there. This is the mound. Some of you will have seen it. We've worked on it before. You can just see here the wing wall of the bridge and just under the top there exposed were some of the edging stones where the power pit wall had been knocked in um, on the corner there and the corner there because the centerpiece had been knocked down when they took out the, key, the keystones. This is, no, I knew I was going to do that and click in the wrong place because I always do that on this bloody presentation. Uh, let me get into there. Right, this is a laser point scan done by a local company for free, which basically once we'd exposed everything um, of the remains of the bridge, we were asked to make an archaeological record of it. So we managed to get this done through um, laser point digital imaging of everything that was there on the day it was done, including the manky old pallet here in the corner, as you can see. But if you actually zoom in on the actual imaging of this, you can get to the point where you can actually read some of the letters stamped on some of the bricks. It really is quite an incredible piece of detail. Um, I'll zoom forward across this. This then becomes, as some of you will have seen, the CAD model of this is what the remains look like. This is how we were going to build the bridge on top of it. And in the interest of time, I'll skip forward to there's the inevitable combine harvester proving that combine harvester does fit onto the new bridge. And that was the reason why it was knocked down in the first place. Um, rattling through waste exemptions. Um, here's our waste exemption or one of them. We've got several. Um, be aware that they expire. The great thing is they can be linear. They don't have to be the one 10 meter square section one by one you can do a linear one we have a linear one by agreement with the environment agency that covers us for the entire length of the old buckingham canal um, currently they're free there is consultation now on changing the exemptions whether it's going to become chargeable by volume by organization or whatever is, is all the stuff that's in the consultation um, personally, I'd recommend if you haven't got a waste exemption, go get one sooner rather than later whilst it's still free. Ask for advice. Um, contrary to popular belief, the Environment Agency don't bite. Well, 
they don't usually answer the phone so not sure how they're going to bite but um we found it was quite engaging because we managed to get hold of someone who helped us with a water extraction license she then got her whole team to come down and paint a lock whilst they were painting the lock we were talking to them picking their brains they gave us some advice in terms of the waste exemption regulations and what we could and couldn't do and it was them that we had the conversations with about is this picture of adrian digging out dry stuff from under a bridge going to be treated as dredging and eligible for the dredging types within the exemption here in this section here on the slide you'll see the exemptions that we registered for including depositing waste from dredging in land water arrays that was the critical one because if you can get that one happy days if you can't get that one big bills and you don't want the big bills um, our EA catchment manager is very helpful I differentiate between in the nicest way the rest of the EA and the catchment managers the catchment managers are usually the local guys who understand the challenges the problems and if you go to them and say I think this is a problem and I think we can do something about it they love you for example at the Buckingham end of ours we've got high levels of phosphate caused by people putting their washing machines in their garage and discharging the water down surface drain straight into the river. Abracadabra, high levels of phosphate. Divert that through a reed bed as part of a proposed development, leach out the phosphate with reeds, make it the sustainable drainage scheme of the entire development, and everybody wins. Um, and, and that's what's on the table for our end at Buckingham. The other bits um, when we've been dredging the arm um, you'll need if it's CRT land you'll need an environmental appraisal that's that's the trigger point for CRT asking their standard set of I'm going to make it, it's probably about 50 55 questions at the moment and you answer yes no and um, off it goes and fires its way around the organization and gets various necessary documents put in place that um, the guys mentioned before you're going to need a waste exemption anyway some cases crt have one that will cover you other cases you might go get your own we've gone and got our own because crt didn't have one for the part of the canal they don't own anymore but we overlapped with the part they do own which caused amazing confusion when we started saying we've got a waste exemption and they looked and said but we haven't given you ours but you can go and register your own no problem um, you need to be a registered, registered waste carrier if moving stuff. So it's no use saying, oh, right, well, we found this old bicycle, these three wheelbarrows and these um, 27 old wheels in the canal. We'll chuck them in the back of a couple of cars and take them to the tip. You need to have a waste carrier license. If someone stops you, you're going to be in difficulties if you haven't got it. There's a single mechanical movement rule that says you can only pick it up and put it down once. Otherwise, you're storing it. Um, so you may need to have storage use as well. Better if you can get away with a single mechanical movement, like onto the bank, and that's where it's living. But if you're putting it into a hopper and then offloading it from a hopper, that's no longer a single mechanical movement. Um, as I say, you might find things in there other than silt. We've all done cleanups and found shopping trolleys and everything else. What's in the silt? Um, these two pictures on this slide, the middle one is the certificate of analysis um, that we had done with CRT um, before we started actively dredging the wet part of the approach to the bridge. Uh, bottom right is, it's a bit small, but you don't need to read it. You can zoom in when you get the slide deck, is the analysis of what's in there. In our example, it's quite low levels of most contaminants including cyanide, cadmium, arsenic, and a few other good things that are in there, all of which uh, 200 years ago, when they were bringing the ash from the coke works and bits were falling off, um, managed to get itself into the canal. Alongside that, we've actually got quite a high level of zinc. Now, given a lot of people take zinc tablets, you'd think that's not a problem, but apparently it causes animals distress to have high levels of zinc. And therefore, you can't put high level zinc dredgings onto soil for agricultural benefit because the cows and the sheep and things will become distressed so we fortunately had an area of bank that's been eroded by the cattle over the years and we've rebuilt that up using the dredgings as we've managed to get them on there 
So we found somewhere to put it. We found out what it was we were putting there and we could get on and do it. Um, a few pretty pictures um, of dredging in action. Top left um, is when we're taking out some of the bund on the approach to the bridge, which you can just see on the side of the picture there. Top right is the hopper we've got on loan from CRT for moving the dredgings. Uh, bottom left is dredging back the side of the mooring area near the bridge. And bottom right, if you can just see on the off side there where those trees are, that's the area where we've been depositing the dredgings to build it back up along with um, the tug we have on loan and the latest spud leg narrow dredger that uh, we've purchased from CRT. And there's some more pictures describing the, the vessels that we've got. Um, interesting things you need to think about are Lola, pollution, and operating methods of dredgers. There is a word ticket out there. It hasn't been active for a while. Lots of discussions going on about it. Uh, did I put it on here? Yes, I did. Um, so when's a boat not a boat? When's it's a floating crane? As you saw there, the picture of Louise is a basically high ab lorry mounted crane that you see the builders merchants delivering with mounted on the back of a wide beam former beat barge that's 110 years old now. Um, so we sort of went asking, saying, what are we going to need to be able to operate that? And everyone went, God knows. So we sort of came up with our own approach that sort of got signed off by some of our CRT health and safety colleagues saying that looks sensible. So number one, anyone who's operating it needs a helmsman ticket. Anyone who's working it with the tug needs a tug ticket. Um, separately, we've gone for commercial high ab courses. So people go and do the lorry mounted crane course. But the big thing you have to be reminded about, I find, is wobbling. Um, even though it's a wide beam, yes, we've got uh, legs we can put down. To be honest, we rarely use them because um, she's quite stable. But when you've got a load on, uh, she will take her back end, which is cut quite low, very close to the water line. If you're using the outboard on it, the weight, the wash from the outboard come over the back quite quickly. So you do get a little bit of wobbling and movement from all of those aspects. Um, other documents here, paperwork and testing and monitoring and more. Um, bottom one there, dissolved oxygen. We have our own dissolved oxygen meter. It costs about 72 quid on um, eBay. It's not a problem to go and get one. You don't need a huge, great 5,000 pound commercial one that you can hire. Go get a simple one that your average lake owner or fisherman has. You can then quite easily monitor it every hour, three hours, whatever you want. All we do when we're doing dredging is to take a photo of the reading every time we take a reading. The photo's date and time stamped, abracadabra, magic record. Um, talk there about silt tests, landowner consent for arisings. The farmer was quite happy that we, we were reinstating the land that his cattle had buggered up. Um, and CRT were quite happy for us to put it there as well because it started to solve that problem. Um, exemptions and consent, waterway consent. I, I deliberately put waterway consent there in terms of if it's a CRT waterway, it needs to be. But whoever the waterway owner is, you're going to need to get their agreement. And bear in mind, our canal has about 12 different owners along it and various interests from the Nature um, Trust, Berkshire Oxygen Wildlife Trust, where we lease a section from them and, and other bits and pieces. Risk assessments and method statements stating the obvious. Um, I think we should be able to share what every society has got in terms of what we're doing there so people can review them and look at what works for them or what doesn't. Don't reinvent the wheel. Feel free to reach out. I'm happy to share ours and I hope others are as well. Um, the good news is this is the last slide. Bit of a plug for my daughter. This weekend, uh, IWA Festival of Water and we're looking for pictures. Pictures of dredging would be good, but other pictures of people doing work stuff. There is a post on Facebook. Um, reach out to head office or email them direct and we'll get them over there. 
that's the end of my slides. Hopefully, we're sort of not too much over time. No, thank, thank you. you. Um, if, if there's any questions, questions if you just, just want to pop them in the question, question and answers um, box, and we, we can, can ask um, Peter, Peter, Mark, and Terry where we've, we've got, got them. About, about I know there's one in there. Um, from Lindsay, Lindsay she's, she's put the restoration of Montgomery now. Um, how long distance wise was the restoration, and then how long did it take from design to completion? And, and did, did you have, have any issues with supply chains, chains and procurement in design and construction, construction phases? That sounds like what's Mark in terms of the current phase of works, but the Montgomery is the restoration that keeps on giving. So it's been going on since 1969 in various phases. Um, and we're still working with the Shops Union Canal Society on the dry section in England to try and get the two bits of water to join up. The work Mark's been doing recently is on the northern section of the Welsh bit that is still in water, but where there are dropped bridges that mean that nav it's not officially navigable. Uh, Mark, uh, could you go on with the um, the bit about the extent and procurement for this phase of works? Yeah, um, just reading, um, I'm getting quite a lot of echo off. Um, we're still in the model of the boat. Now, the distance wise, uh, Van der Manic down to Ardleen is seven kilometres. That's the section we're looking at now, so that brings you uh, from Van der Manic on the border of the England and Wales through Carrigo for Locks, down through Burnley Aqueduct, through Four Crosses, past Murdy Crossing. And we're just south of there is the end of the project. Um, design to completion. Well, we're, we're phasing it. So the design is sort of ongoing. We're, we're looking at each phase as and when it comes along. But obviously, we're, we're pre planning ahead, trying to get funds signed up for use of land, etc. It's a difficult one. We normally say that we need six months to plan and get everything in order for a normal, if there is such a thing as a normal dredging job. But when, you, when you're working with NRW and all the hoops you have to jump through, all the approvals, licenses, permits, they can sit on them for well over a month before you get an answer. If the answer is no, they'll go back to the drawing board. So you can see there's a lot of time that can be eaten away very quickly, just waiting for the correct licenses and permits to come through. If you were to ask me how long I'd need, realistically, I would say 12 months. That's in order to get everything right. But because this project incorporates dredging, tree works, bridges and reserves, there's obviously a hell of a lot more work and there's about five project managers working on this. Um, supply chains, not really. We were, In terms of supplies, the, the contract will normally deal with a lot of the supplies. Uh, we have gone out to tender. Uh, they came, they repriced tenders came back on Friday. So we've got to look through them, uh, look at the price of mythology and lots of the criteria for the award phase two to one of our two contractors, which are Land and Water Services and Ebsford Environmental. So one of them will be carrying out work in October. Um, I think that really covers the procurement side. It's, um, we're obviously jumping through hoops for LUF. So Powers Council are auditing us on behalf of the funder. And they are very, very strict. They want to know everything we're doing, why we're doing it, what we're spending the money on, why we're spending so much money or not enough money. So they are being very strict with that. Um, I hope that covers that. Thanks, Mark. Um, 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 I do, do apologise if everybody's saying I'm echoing. echoing. Am I still echoing, echoing now? now? Yeah, no worries, Mama. I don't know what happens with your echo, but that, that's fine. I will read the next session. Uh, okay. the question, sorry. Okay, um, thank you. Yeah. No problem. Uh, when dredging underwater, this is from Adam, uh, how do you know and validate where you've been and that the required profile has actually been achieved? So 
So you you do surveys. So for the with canals that are in water and are navigable, we use um, echo sounding gear to actually create a three D picture of the bed, and then that tells us where we need to dredge and what needs to be dredged. On site, the contractor is much more likely to manually dip with a staff from a tug, um, and obviously in a in a restoration scenario where potentially the canal is not navigable, what Mark did on. The Montgomery was that we did manual dipping just from a little skiff boat, so something you know, or did something very shallow that can still get through in in not very much depth of water, um, and just using a a, a a a stick with a tape mark on it so that you you've got an idea of, of how deep it is, and the contractor uses something similar to check their progress and to ensure that they're compliant before they tell us that they think they've done as much as is required. Um, we would quite often go with them on those dipping trips to actually see the dips for ourselves in order to accept it. Um, and then we we ask for a formal um, survey after the works, which obviously if you're working in the water, once you've fully restored, you can do that echo sounder survey again to confirm that everything has actually been picked up. But the the day-to-day -day method is manual dipping with a, with a stick from a boat or the tug. Just to elaborate a little bit on that, Peter, you showed the cross-sectional canal, and that is one of the profiles which shows a cross-section of a canal that's been physically dipped by a third party. We we tend to have um, a survey. They'll either do a dip test or they'll do echo sound if we're on a river. Echo sound is very good over a metre deep, or normally two metres plus. You get some very accurate sonar data. When you get into the shallow water, it picks up lots of things like vegetation, which is very hard to distinguish when you're trying to tune your um, your echo sound to phase them out. But generally, we'll have a survey done by a third party, which is pre-dredge, where we calculate the volumes, and post-dredge, where we can actually determine how much volume has been removed from the canal, and is the canal meeting the desired profile. But the, the dipping with basically a stick and a tape is a very quick, rough and ready way of doing it. But I find it's very accurate. As far as knowing when you've actually hit the profile, you can imagine these drivers on the excavators are very experienced and it's like a, a third arm to them. So when they put the bucket in the water and slew across the canal, if they feel any bumps and knocks on the bucket, they'll know they haven't got the depth right. Usually they'll put a marker on the boom, which is just a straight paint line. If you ever go out to a dredging job and you see a you know, blue line across the jib, you know that the dredger driver knows that when he puts the jib into that depth, he's achieved the depth he's trying to get to. So that's just another quick and easy way of knowing that when we've got to the right depth. And obviously we don't want to overdress because some canals have got the clay lining. And the last thing we want is a breach on All right, thank you all. Um, we have another question uh, from Wine. What depth are you looking for? It varies on different canals and rivers. We have what we call the MOC, which is the minimum open channel. That's the minimum that we try and keep the canal. So the Montgomery and lots of other canals are usually around 1.1 metres from the MOC. In order to be able to push loaded hoppers through the canal, we need slightly deeper than that, so we're not catching the bottom all the time and creating lots of stability. Generally, we try and hit 1.35 metres on a canal, and that gives us the extra water depth for pushing these loaded hoppers, but also makes the, the time frame that we have to go back and redredge longer. Do you imagine the deeper it is, the more it can silt up before it hits our trigger level, which is the MOC. So normally we'd like to try and get down to a hard bed, whether that be near the clay or on a, a bedrock on some canals. Or in contrast, the River Weaver is 3.6 or 3.2 if you want to get near town swingers. So that's just a contrast to the difference in depth that we might be trying to achieve.
Thank you, Mark. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure, sure if I'm still, still echoing, echoing, but I do apologise if I am. Um, are, are there any more questions before we move, move on? on? No? no? Okay. okay. Um, I think, think that's, that's time, time then to wrap it up. up. Um, stay stay safe and I'd just like to thank, thank all of our speakers, speakers um, for taking the time to deliver um, the webinar. I'd like, like to thank, thank Rina for the facilitating, facilitating the session. session. Um, thank, thank you everybody, everybody that took time out to join us and, and for asking questions. questions. Um, our, our next, next webinar um, that, that's going to be run jointly from, from CRT and, and the IWA will be on the 20th of October. And, and the, the topic, topic will be licensing and permissions for restoration, for restoration, for restoration work. work. Um, so, so we'll, we'll put, put a link in uh, the chat box for you to um, register for that. that. Um, any, any other updates, updates will be after the next webinar. Keep an eye out on social media um, channels um, and your inboxes. Um, but in, in the meantime, meantime there are lots of resources available on, on both Planning and River Trust and the IWA website. And, and Facebook, Facebook pages. pages. Um, thanks, thanks again, again for, jo for joining us, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the week. week. Thank you all, and thank you for bearing with us uh, with the sound issues. Thank you.